All right, well, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are moving on to um, uh, another uh, important discussion um, uh, about uh, basically the idea of building back better um, uh, in a world in which we're all trying to recover from the pandemic. Um, one of the things we've heard frequently uh, since the pandemic broke out um, was talk about how countries would steer not only through the health crisis, but also uh, row back from the massive economic crisis that has ensued. So this mantra of building back better um, has become a new, in many ways, political catchphrase uh, for an agenda that uh, basically aims to better protect public services, tackle in inequality, and create a more shock-proof economy while tackling climate change. So I'm pleased to welcome, uh, for this discussion, uh, distinguished gentleman from Greece, Lukas Soukalis. You're with the Greek uh, Foundation for Foreign Policy uh, and also a professor in Paris. And I also want to welcome uh, two uh, panelists from afar, um, Azim Azar, who is the force behind Exponential View, which is a wildly popular newsletter on how tech affects the future of the global economy, um, as well as Hervé uh, Berville, who is a member of uh, the French Parliament. Um, and a spokesman for the La République uh, en Marche party. Let me, uh, I'm really eager to get to our two uh, virtual uh, participants here, but since I have Luca right in front of me, let me start by asking you, since we're here in Greece, um, you know, this is a country, like many others in, in Europe and around the world, that has been recovering from an economic crisis only to be hit by COVID. Um, but now we are seeing a kind of a major effort in this country to build back better. For example, you've got the digitalization uh, of public services, uh, building investments you know, for a green economy, um, and, and a major EU recovery plan. But I mean, is it possible to shockproof Greece or really any other country against future calamities? Surely not. I mean, first of all, let us remember that Greece went through a hellish decade. Uh, economic crisis that led to a reduction of Greek GDP by 25%, unprecedented for any developed country in the post-world period, uh, and then hit by a pandemic. So it's really a bit too much for a problem to face. Uh, Greece has been recovering, and it's now in the process of not only recovering, but also accelerating both the digital and the green transformation of the Greek economy with the help of the European Recovery Program. And this is one factor that makes a huge difference with the way Europe and the European Union in particular try to tackle or not tackle the two crises. Because with the Euro crisis, Europe took a long time and basically did very little, insisted on the economics of austerity, which worsened the problem in virtually the whole of Europe. Now, with the pandemic, European political leaders luckily realized that one, if they repeated the same experience they had with the Euro crisis, the risk of the European Union splitting apart would be very high. So that's why we ended up with an extremely ambitious recovery program, which also leads to the first mutual mutualization of European debt, which is not exactly the Hamiltonian moment, for Europe, but it's just an important first step. So Greece is going to benefit from that, but of course there are wider issues which I hope we'll be able to discuss later on in the discussion. Well, on, on that note, actually, let me turn to Hervé uh, in France. Um, I mean, Hervé, you uh, as a member of parliament uh, have often talked about the need to think globally um, if we're to make any economic model successful. Is this goal of building back better really enough, actually, to build a long-term global recovery? We're having trouble hearing you. Maybe you might be on mute. No. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm really glad to be part of this uh, interesting conversation. And once again, sorry for not being able to be with you physically. Yes, you, you're right. When we think about like, rebuilding our our economies, can you hear me well? Yes. 
Okay, can we think about like rebuilding our economies and, and, and the global recovery? We need, of course, to, to think about building back better, but I think the most important issue is to make sure that we, we talk about building back together. And when I say building back together, meaning that we have different paths that we can uh, take right now to overcome all those challenges. And right now, uh, global, uh, all over the world, you have like, let's say, at least uh, four different models, four different uh, economic models. The first one that you can see developing quite rapidly over the last five years was the what I call like the the, the new uh, imperialism of China with the the, the, the the Belt and Road Initiative. And you can see right now in a lot of developing countries also that the, this uh, promise of instructor financing is turning into a debt trap. There is also uh, 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 what the, the US are, are, are doing, this kind of mercantilism. And you can see right now with the submarine like issue, that I think is not really a, a good way of building trust. And that's not really a good way of like uh, strengthening the alliances. And there is also one of the model here in, in Europe also uh, uh, with the UK, with the protectionism. And I don't really think that uh, what you can see right now with the fuel crisis and, and how it's damaging the, the British economy, that's a, a good model for us. So my opinion and what we're trying to do in Europe and exactly what we're, our colleague and distinguished panelists were saying also, is try to really build this recovery on multilateralism, making sure that what we're doing is not just a contest, a quest for power, but making sure that multilateral institution cooperation is at the heart, at the center of the global recovery, and that this new economic model should go way beyond the Washington consensus, the way beyond what I just called the Beijing consensus, and making sure, for example, that global public good, such as health, education, and climate change, are at the center of the global recovery, because this is the only way, this is the only way to tackle uh, all the global challenge, uh, uh, challenges and issues such as cyber security attacks, such as uh, uh, pandemics, and such as uh, uh, climate change, I did just say. Well, thank you for that. And uh, if I can move it over to Azim, I mean, obviously one of the other major elements um, in helping to sustain any kind of recovery from the pandemic um, has to do with the quality of jobs. Um, and basically the way that, you know, uh, companies uh, are operating in society. We've had, um, we've seen basically divisions in society open up, inequalities become even mm -hmm. greater since the pandemic started. And you um, uh, had a column in Wired magazine recently entitled, uh, The Exponential Age Will Transform Economics Forever, um, which talked about how our inability to understand that we're living in a moment of exponential change could tear apart economies and society. Can you just explain to us, you know, what do you mean by that? And what are the implications of it at a time when countries are looking for ways to reset their economies from the impact of the mm. pandemic? Uh, yeah, thank you so much. And once again, to echo Efe's uh, uh, observations, it's wonderful to be here. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there uh, in person. Where we found ourselves just before the pandemic was still an uncomfortable uh, position uh, in the sense that even though uh, employment levels were very high uh, in most of the richer economies in the world, uh, there was certainly significant questions about the quality of that employment as we move to apply these uh, exponential technologies and we build platforms uh, like, like Uber and many others we see a bifurcation in not necessarily the quantity of workers, but the quality of that work. And when we look at what's happened uh, during the pandemic, the big uh, winners in, in, in industry have been those uh, digital network platforms. Amazon added 800,000 workers globally uh, since the pandemic started. And at one high level, that's a great number. That is 800,000 more families with, with employment. But one of the things that we have noticed, it's something I write about in my, in my book, is that the relative power between the corporation and the worker has shifted dramatically in favor of the corporation over the last 40 or 50 years as we've implemented these advanced uh, technologies. Uh, we see that in me measures like the labor share of national income, which has been declining in pretty much 
all over the rich world. And, and so we sit at a, a moment where uh, we have to ask whether the traditional orthodoxies of our economics uh, still make sense. Do they serve us? So they perhaps may serve a top line GDP figure, but they don't necessarily serve the equity figure. And much of that is driven by the changing nature of power between the companies of this digital age uh, and the workers who they employ. I, mean, no, I fully what... agree. I mean, if we look back at what happened in the last two or three decades, and I shall be very brief, let's think about it. First of all, we had a technological revolution, a technological revolution that comes with many blessings, no doubt about it. But it has also raised fundamental questions that have already been discussed in this conference about individual freedoms, privacy, democracy, concentration of power and abuse of power. The other main development of the last three decades has been the globalization of the economy. A globalization of the economy that has contributed to growth, has contributed to prosperity in general. It has helped to bring out of abject poverty a few hundreds of millions of people, especially in a country like China. But at the same time, it has created much more unequal societies in the Western world. The United States is the most extreme example of that inequality, of an unequal and divided society. Also, much instability, and it has contributed to climate change. Yeah. Now, what we need to reflect upon is how we restore the balance between efficiency and equity, between market power and democracy. And I believe these are the fundamental challenges facing us today. Well, Hervé, if I could jump back to you for a moment. I mean, protecting, uh, protecting against you know, rising inequalities is uh, one of the major you know, issues that you mentioned that you think is, is very Im important. And certainly, obviously, in a country like France, it's, it's highly prized. Um, but I mean, how, how can we sort of you know, ensure that this actually happens, this, that there's a better balance between the you know, wealthy countries and countries that need more help. Um, for example, with the vaccine, global vaccine rollouts, we've seen um, a, a global divide, an inequality divide, where we've had wealthy countries uh, pledge to step up in terms of uh, uh, shipping more vaccines to countries that really need it, and those pledges are not really being fulfilled. So in, in a major way or in a significant enough way, I mean, so how, I mean, how do you propose uh, that you know, governments sort of keep their pledges to prevent um, what we see as widening inequality in, in the world in terms of social protections. You're, I think you might be on mute again. <laughs> Hi, Martin. Er, okay, there you go. I can hear you. Yeah, Paris is not that far, but it seems that uh, <laughs> there is a still a digital divide. A little bit right. um, no i think like when i said like also building back better it means uh making sure that we all understand that that this new economic model uh, must be think at the global level because all those global challenges that you just mentioned they have uh, an impact on our domestic agenda and as a member of parliament i can see on a daily basis that all those questions of cyber security climate change, uh, pandemics, uh, immigration, uh, trade, they were discussed in my constituency. And then we, we, we will be failing uh, collectively if we would thought that uh, just like talking about um, economy or social protection at the national level would be the solution. So one of the options is really right now understanding that social protection, public services, must be dealt at the international level, at the global level. And that we need to make sure that all those multilateral institutions, all those collective uh, way of tackling those challenges, they also must focus on social protection. And, and, and for example, uh, it's really time to, to make sure that, for example, um, in the lowest, uh, uh, the, the low income country, uh, we can provide collectively uh, basic uh, income, we can provide universal health coverage, we can provide uh, agricultural uh, insurance mechanism because 
as we say, it's a little bit to catch phrase, but it's a reality. And the pandemic showed us that now it's a harsh reality. No one is safe until everybody is safe. So it means like, uh, probably, uh, I think it's, it could be a good idea, create, for example, a new institution, for example, a global public good institution, uh, ensuring financing those kind of individual social protection in the low income countries. Because this is the, the way forward if we want to build a new economic model of the 21st uh, century. And we can see also with, the, with this pandemic that uh, all those economic consensus, for example, the Washington consensus saying like, for example, uh, you need to do structural reform in exchange for financial financial uh, uh, resources, or you need um, to, 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 to give natural resources uh, in exchange for uh, financial infrastructure. All of this is not working, it's a dead end. So we need this new consensus based on global public good, and we need to make sure that all our multilateral financial institutions are really trying to provide those goods and try, trying to provide uh, this social security uh, for individuals. Uh -huh. And we, we have just a few minutes left, so uh, I will be taking questions from the audience. If you have one, please raise your hand and uh, get it ready. But before I turn to the audience, I mean, Azim, talk to us a little bit more, mm -hmm. if, you, if you can, about um, you know, how, uh, I mean, as we try to build back better, what, what is the role that, I mean, we just talked about sort of the downsides of, of uh, that technology companies, the, the role that, that they can play um, on the labor market, but, I mean, how can tech, what, what do you see as a, uh, the role, of, uh, the positive role for, mm -hmm. for tech to help in the build back better scenario? No. Let me build on uh, Hervé's uh, observation about global public goods. Uh, one of the successes from COVID was that there were some global public goods, um, open source genome databases that allowed scientists to very quickly identify and share strains of this novel virus uh, 15, 16 months ago. And so we have seen the benefits of some of these global mutual services. And, and the question is, can politicians persuade us to invest more heavily in them and those will be enabled by technology but, but but i think the second thing that we can look to is the technologies that we require for supporting the transition to a net zero economy uh, and those technologies uh, include uh, renewable power they include the combination of computing and biology to create new industrial processes that have lower resource footprints some of these are more mature, technologies of renewable power, some of these are more experimental, but there is an opportunity for, uh, for us to make use of them. But I think the challenge, and why it's so relevant to have this conversation with my colleagues here and at the uh, Athens Democracy Forum, is not about the technology, it's about the governance of those technologies and the relevant political and democratic accountability that can manage the direction. Great. Do we have a question from the audience? All right. Let me. I, in that case, I would like to wrap up with with you, Luca. I mean, what what do you a year from now when we're sitting here, all of the sort of hopes and aspirations that we've been talking about here, how how far ahead will we have moved? I think the two main challenges facing us is first of all more public responsibility to brought to restore the symmetry between market and democracy. And the second is global cooperation. You need both. So if I may, I mean, mind you, 30 years ago, Bill Clinton came to power with the slogan, it's the economy stupid. I believe to a large extent we are now in a world, it's politics stupid. <laughs> Terrific. Well, thank you so much. On that note, uh, we're going to wrap up, but I want to thank all of you uh, from, uh, from afar and from here for, for being with us today. Thank you very much.